light is just like any other part in physics governed by laws. There are two laws of reflection, uh, two very important laws of reflection. One is that the incident ray, which is the ray of light that falls on a surface, must make an equal angle with the perpendicular drawn to the surface, just like the reflected ray does. Without diagrams, it's tough for you to understand. So I will just show it to you in a second. The angle of incidence must be equal to the angle of reflection. Two angles must be equal. The second law is that if you were listening, I spoke about three lines. One is the incident ray that falls on a surface. The second is the perpendicular drawn to that surface, right? And the third is the reflected ray. All three of these must lie in the same plane. That's why learning about this becomes easy, because if they were in different planes, it was going to be tough. So if that is a reflecting surface, the shading shows that that's not the surface that's reflecting, okay? It's the opposite surface. So that's the perpendicular drawn. You have an incident ray. You have a reflector ray. I didn't draw it equally, but theta i must be equal to theta r. That's the first law of reflection. The second one, all three must lie in the same plane, the plane of the white board, okay? I was just trying to see what you, how much you would understand without the diagram. And here is the diagram that is kind of 3D. So with that, you should understand, right? Whatever is the nature of the surface, these laws always hold good, whatever it is. It could be a plane surface. It could be a curved surface. Whenever light is reflected, these two are always true. So although I said law of reflection is actually laws of reflection, is that clear enough? Theta i is equal to theta r, and all three are in the same plane, so that gives you a 3D idea that they must be in the same plane. But there are two types of reflections. This is an irregular reflection. That's why when I look at this surface, I can't see my face in it. Does it reflect light? Because you know, if you can see an object, it reflects light. You can see objects only because they reflect light, and the light goes into your eye. But you know you can't see your face in it because it's irregular. Although you touch it and say, oh, that's so smooth, look at it through a microscope, you're going to see the surface this way. Do you believe me? Therefore, the rays get reflected in different directions, they don't go into your eye together. That is irregular reflection. But if the surface was perfectly smooth and perfectly plain, then depending on where you stand, you are going to see an image. That's beautiful, isn't it? Okay. Now this also shows you how to get an image. Take a look at it carefully. Another thing is from this diagram, the person does not require a mirror that is as tall as the person to see the full image. Is that clear enough? So that'll be, that, that'll be one of the questions for you. What would be the size of the mirror required? How would we calculate it? Simple idea is, if she needs to see the top part of her head, then an incident ray from that point should reach her eye. If she needs to see her toes, well, this is not from the toes, but if she needs to see this to be more perfect, then a ray from there should also reach her eye. That makes sense, doesn't it? And so that's the minimum size of the mirror required. And watch this. This angle, the angle of reflection, is equal to the angle of incidence. Again, if there was a perpendicular drawn here, which is not drawn, the two angles would have been equal. That's perfect, right? And if you look at this image, it's not a real image. It's not a real image because the rays after reflection do not actually go there. Where are the reflected rays? One reflected ray, the second one. Do you see that? Hello? 
But do they come from the same point? No. They don't actually meet. So this image that you see is a virtual image, a false image. There are four characteristics for an image. Before I show you, just look at the four characters. What about the size of the object and the image? The object is here, same size. What about the distance? Distances are always measured from the reflecting surface. And this distance is called DO, object distance. And the distance is called, this distance is called? DI. And what's the relation between DO and DI in this case? Mathematically, just give it out to me as an equation. Equal. DO is equal to? Yeah. And you're wrong. <laughs> because if you say DO is equal to DI, then the object and the image should have been at the same point. It's not. The image is that much behind, isn't it? So DO is equal to negative DI. What does the negative sign show? It shows you that it's not a real image. So if you have a negative sign with any symbol, it shows it's not real. Is that clear enough? We're starting out with an equation for, and this is of course a plane mirror as you can see. It's plane, the surface is plane, so. All right, that's regular reflection and the four properties of the image coming up image properties. And as I write this, think about what you saw before. Number one, it's called the nature of the image. The, and it has two possibilities. An image could either be real or it could be virtual. In the last case it was virtual. And the type of image, it could be upright or it could be inverted, right? Upright or inverted. The size of image, there could be three chances now. The, it could be either magnified, diminished. Diminished means smaller in size than the object or the same size. And position of the image, oh, there are several possibilities now. As we go on, we'll see. And in the last case, we saw that the position of the image was exactly equal to, but that much behind as the object was in front. We'll see. But, you know, scientists are people who think. They said if there's a plane reflecting surface, why can't we have a spherical reflecting surface? And, uh, you know, it's a part of a sphere. If you de did see what happened, did you see that? I had drawn a sphere first and then... So a spherical mirror is a part of a sphere. It's just cut out. So it will have a center, isn't it? because every sphere has a center, right? And also, it'll have a geometrical center. What do you mean by geometrical center? If you measure the length of this, uh, you will be able to get the exact central point. And so now you have two points. The line joining those two points is called the principal axis. That line is called the principal axis. So you have the center. You have the geometrical center, which is called the pole. So you have the pole and the center, and the line joining them is called the principal axis. And which side is reflecting, as shown in the diagram? Because I, you can see the shaded side. The inner side or outer side? Outside. I told you the shaded surface is not the reflecting one. It's the other side. So it's the inner side. This is called a concave mirror, just like the palm of my hand. It's reflecting the inside. But if the outside was reflecting, it's a convex mirror. So that's the difference. Concave, the inside of the sphere is reflecting. Convex, the outside is reflecting. OK, let's consider that there are two incident rays falling on it. And these two rays are parallel to the principal axis, as you can see, right? Are they, are they parallel to the principal axis? Yes. Will the law of reflection be obeyed? I told you it will always be obeyed. I just want to tell you one thing. If you would draw, I don't remember whether I did draw a perpendicular here. Did anybody know that the perpendicular would go through the center? Because the radius and tangent are at 90 degrees always. So in case I did not, watch this carefully. That would be the angle of incidence, right? And then the reflected ray should go in such a way that the angles are equal. So it will go right there. 
obeying the law of reflection, now you see that the two reflected rays actually converge. They meet each other. That's not imagination. That really happens. So that point, that point is a real point. It's not a virtual point. You see, there's no imagination there. They come together. So that point is called the principal focus. And the focus of a concave mirror is real. Why? Because the arrays actually meet. And this distance PF is called the focal length. All distances are measured from the pole. That's the focal length. PC is the radius. What's the relation between them? Two. Definitely. Radius is equal to two times the focal length, right? And I was saying, like I told you, it's a real focus. And that's PF is the focal length. And that's a concave mirror, of course. And I also want you to write down that the radius is equal to twice the focal length. Radius is twice the focal length. So in a problem, is the, if the radius is given, you always work with the focal length. You take half of that. That's what I mean. So be careful. If it's a convex, okay, again, look at what I did. That's a convex mirror coming up. No, sorry. That's, again, concave. I'm trying to give you another image. But let me ask you one thing. If you turn, because we need to keep the thinking going on, otherwise you fall asleep. If you turn a concave mirror, take it out and focus it, I mean, turn it towards the sun. Turn it towards the sun. Where do you think? The sun is the object, really. And where do you get, think you will get the image? Pick up a concave mirror, take it out. The sun is the object, and we know that the sun is really, really far away, correct? So you can assume that's, that it's at infinite distance away. And remember that whenever the object is very far away, the incident rays are going to be parallel. And if they are parallel, then they are all going to converge at the center or at the focus? At the focus. So where are you going to get the image of the sun? At the focus. How big is it going to be? It's going to be a point. It's going to be a point. Is it upright or inverted? We don't know. How can we say whether a point is upright or inverted? You see? Mm -hmm. But the same thing that happens to light also happens to heat. We saw that both are electromagnetic waves, didn't we, yesterday? So it's not only light that is being focused, it's also heat. That's why if you put your hand right there at the focus, you will cry out loud. Because the heat rays are also focusing. So you see the tiny spot, and you also have the heat rays focusing. You know from high school that you can actually burn a dry leaf or something using. This also works with a... How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, so it's both focusing. Just to understand that. Both focusing. All right, right now, so in that case, the object was at infinite distance. Where was the image? The image was at the focus, right? Now imagine that the object is coming towards the concave mirror. It's just moving. And right now, the object is here. So where would you say it is when you look at this point? You would say it's beyond the center, right? Because you always look at from the pole. It's beyond the center. We need to find out where its image is. To do that, you need at least two rays. To find any image, you need at least two rays. The first ray, parallel, what happens to it? You can already see it. It always passes through the focal point, correct? A parallel ray will always go through the focal point. How do you want me to draw the second one? Through the P. Through the P? Okay, what, I don't know what, which one I drew. What if I draw this before I show it to you? If I have an incident ray that goes through the focal point, can anybody tell me what will happen after reflection? Correct, because everything in light is reversible. If an incident ray is parallel, it goes through the focus, right? If the incident ray goes through the focus, and after reflection it goes, I, I don't know what I drew. Oh, that's exactly what I drew. So they both meet at this point, right? Do they? Is that a real point or is it a virtual point? It's real. And uh, surely those two rays started from the head of the object, so that must be the head of the image. 
And working the same way, we know that all these points must have the image produced right below it or above it. Therefore, you have the image with two rays. What are the properties of that image? Simple. Is it real or virtual? Real. real inverted. inverted. Diminished. Between F and C. Finished. I have a question. Go ahead. Is it safe to say any time the object is outside of C, the image is always going to be between F and C? Very safe to say and that. Is it safe any to say it's always real and inverted? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. It's always real, inverted, between F and C, as long as the object is beyond C. Okay? Is that clear? But what if the object now comes further ahead and comes exactly to C? Comes exactly to C. Can you guess? Uh, can you guess? Because you know what has, what has been happening when the object was infinite distance away. Where was the image? Where was the image? It was at F, right? Come on, it was at F. And so, as the object is approaching the mirror, what's happening to the image? It's going further away, isn't it? It's going further away, and you can see that it's getting bigger too. Because what was the size of the image when it was at infinite distance? It was just a... So now we know that even that point was, that image was inverted. Because it's a continuous process. So therefore, when the object is at the center, can you draw the diagram and show me where the image would be? Go ahead. So, object A, image B, it's real, it's inverted. We said all this. This is kind of repetition because this is moving slowly, go fast, all right. It's smaller in size or diminished, and it's between the focus and the center of curvature, right? Don't want to go too fast, okay. That's very clear. Now before we go ahead, I want you to do one more thing. Can you see two triangles? You can set, see a set of triangles there if your eyes are open. Can you see? I should have labeled this point. Help me out. What's that point? Yes, F. Okay, please put that. So that, that would be O, A, F. And if I had labeled this point, I would have another right angle triangle here. Do you see that? And the opposite angles are surely equal. And these two sides are going to be proportional. Bigger the object, bigger the image, isn't it? And not only that, these two are right angles. Anybody with me? If these three conditions are satisfied, then you know that the triangles are similar. Have you heard of similar triangles? And in similar triangles, we know that the ratio of their sides must be equal. When you do all that, and when you set up the ratios to be equal, you can easily derive this very important form, which I have not done. 1 by DO plus 1 by DI is equal to 1 by F. You can easily derive that from, the, from a set of two triangles. Set them equal to each other. It's in your textbook. Try to get it from there. I'm not going to ask you for how you're going to derive. It's that easy. I'm just saving maybe three or four minutes. But that is called the law of distances. Law of distances, 1 by DO plus 1 by DI is equal to 1 by F. Everybody knows what DO is. DO is donkey. No, DO is object distance. DI is, and F is the. Now, one question. Will you take F as positive or negative for a concave mirror? Does it have a real focus or a virtual focus? So F is positive. All real distances are positive. So if the problem is to do with a concave mirror, the focal length is positive. But if it's a convex mirror, the focal length is negative, as I'm going to show you. Keep that in mind. Again, concave mirror has a real focus. Therefore, F is always positive. All right, now I want to show you that a concave can also produce a virtual image. Watch this. Last time it was a real image, and even here it is real, isn't it? All right, let me try this with somebody. What if the object is between F and C? So it moves further ahead, right? Who knows where the image will be? 
Remember, everything is reversible. <coughs> if the object is here, where would the image be? It will be beyond C. Remember, when the object was beyond C, wasn't the object between F and C? And I said everything is reversible. Therefore, if the object is here, where's the image? Will it be upright or inverted? Common sense, inverted. Will it be magnified or diminished? Magnified. By now, you should have made out if you draw those rays, it's going to be big here. Hello? It's going to be... Okay, and finally, not, not finally, one step before the final. What if the object is exactly at the focal point? Where is the image? No, Nishant? She said the right answer. She said it will be at infinite distance. Correct. When the object was at infinite distance, where was the image? At the focal point. Therefore, if the object is at the focal point, <coughs> if you're listening to me, you simply get your grade. If you're just listening to me, that's a good thing about optics. Okay. Uh, you can see something at infinite distance because where is the sun? It's at infinite distance. You can see it. Means very far away. That's what it means. We'll come to the questions at the end because I have this virtual image already up after I finish this. But if you bring the object closer, do you see that now it's when it was at the focal point? When it was at the focal point, the image is already at infinite distance, right? And there's nothing beyond infinity. So if you move it further ahead, see what happens. A parallel ray goes through the focus. Now I cannot draw another ray through the focus because it will not fall on the mirror, right? Therefore, I'm just drawing another ray at the pole, making sure that this angle is equal to this angle. And if you watch this, are these two reflected rays, are they going to meet each other? No. What that means, it's not a real image. Therefore, your imagination works. Now you'll have to extend both the reflected rays backwards. And when I drew this, I was not sure whether I would get it on the screen. Therefore, I might have, hey, I did that adjustment, which you never do. All right, never make that adjustment. I hope that's clear. Please don't bend it this way. Light rays never bend. But I was lazy. I didn't want to draw it all over again. Is it clear enough? Okay, what are the properties of this image? It's upright, it's virtual, it's magnified, and it's behind the mirror, of course. So if you want to use the concave mirror to, to make up, like some of you do, spending 30 minutes or 45 minutes, well, you can do whatever, but that should not be at the expense of time that you could have used for studying. Or you want to shave, you want to have a clean shave, that's not the fashion anymore, but anyway. How would you hold the concave mirror, is the question. Now your face is the object, right? If you hold the mirror this way, so that the object, which is your face, is beyond C, you're going to get an inverted image. You will shave off your nose. <laughs> so now you can see that the only time you get an upright image, which is what you need when you make up or shave, right? is when you hold your face between the pole and the focal point. So if that's the pole and the focal point is somewhere here, you have to have your face close enough so it's between the pole and the focal point. That's when you will get a magnified upright image and you can make up and cover all the holes and make up, you know, and look beautiful until it rains. Okay. <laughs> okay. So those are the properties of the virtual image. Convex. There. Okay, I told you that the outside should be reflected. And never mind, you can have it this way or that way. Okay, some people ask me, how should it be facing? Come on now. It can be facing any direction, but the outside should be reflected. But the center should be the center. Okay, everybody knows that. The center and the focal point. And the, all right. Well, uh, uh, uh. So that's an object. That's an object. I cannot specify its position. I can only say it's somewhere there because, you know, P, F, and C are on this other side. 
It's behind, and you can't have an object behind. It's of no use. So, some of them. Look at the first ray. Be careful now. A parallel ray. How should it go? Can it go through the focus? Can it go through the focal point? It can't because it has to be reflected. But it will be reflected in such a way that when you extend it backwards, it has to seem to be coming from the focal point. That's the idea. It has to be reflected in exactly that direction so that when you extend it backwards, it should appear to be coming from the focal point. And same thing with this one. It should be extended backwards. When I said same thing, I didn't mean that it should pass through the focal point. Just extend it backwards. And they seem to intersect at that point. Yeah, I drew both. Uh, we'll come to that later on. Just take a look at this one. Is this point a real point or is it imaginary? It's a virtual point. That's why a convex mirror can only produce a virtual image. It cannot produce a real image. And what are the properties of this image? It's virtual, upright, it's smaller than the object, definitely, and it's between P and F, always, between P and F. Think about the rear view mirrors that you use in your car. Is it concave or convex? Be careful, where's the driver seated? Where is the driver? Which side is the driver's face? Is it on this side one or on the side two? I'm asking you, where is the driver? I'm talking about the side view mirrors in your car. Oh, so you don't have those? Should inform the police. Come on. I'm not talking about the rear view in the middle down there. That could be or could not be. Sometimes it's a plain mirror. Okay, I'm talking about the side view mirrors. So, it's like this, right? Or like that? My question. If the palm is the reflecting surface, if the palm is the reflecting surface, is this how it is for the driver here? Then yeah. that's a concave mirror. Yeah. So that's not how it is. How is it? Oh. <laughs> that way, right? And you are here. Where is the image going to be? The image is always going to be between P and F, which is on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. F is here. So the image is going to be close to your eye. Because it can't go further away than the focal point. Are you listening to me? We need it close to the eye so that we can make out what it is. So is number one? two, number two, the image Sorry. is diminished. Isn't the image diminished? Mm -hmm. It has to be diminished. Think about the concave mirror. If we had been using that, it would have been gigantic images, inverted first. Remember the big images? And you look at that coming, ooh, inverted, you, you be scared to death. <laughs> now, in this case, it can only produce an upright image. And the size of the image can only get to be as big as the object itself. It cannot get bigger. Number three, I'm giving you advantages of using a convex mirror. Number three, because it's curved like this, it can catch incident rays from a wider field. Can it? So if you have five lanes, it can catch everything, but if it is concave, <laughs> look at this. It can only get it in this area, right? Are you watching me? So three advantages of using a convex mirror as a side view mirror. What are the three? Number one, it's the image is close to the driver's eye. Two, it's always upright. Three, it has a wider field of view. Is it all making sense? Okay. And... I just wanted to show you this diagram. I don't want to, um, well, just tell me this. I did not have a diagram for that. I thought I did. Is the focal point real or virtual for a convex mirror? The focal point. The focal point. How would you find that? You just had to draw all parallel rays falling on this. Where would they, would they really meet? No, they would diverge. Are you, can you see that? And they would all be appearing to come from the focal point. Therefore, a convex mirror is a diverging mirror. Concave is a converging mirror. You know the difference between the two? Yeah, when the school bell goes, imagining I'm in high school, 
all students converge to the school. When the home bell rings, they are totally in a different mood. Now they diverge. That's the difference. Spend time on this because I did talk about each one of them. Remember that? Infinity, the image is at the focal point. It's coming closer, it's here. Does anybody remember this? When the object is at the center, the image is also at the center. And then if the, image, uh, the object comes closer between P and F, the image is here. The object is at the focal point. Do you see that these two are parallel to each other? So where is the image? Where do parallel lines meet? At infinity. Last one, but not the least. When the object is between the pole and the focal point, for the first time, the image is virtual and upright. Did that make any sense? If so, you understood everything. So to conclude, the summary is concave mirrors can produce both real and virtual images. They have a real focus. Convex mirrors have a virtual focus and can only produce a virtual image. OK. That was the first part of the chapter. Now the second part is called refraction. So the first part was reflection. The second part is refraction. Refraction of light happens when light goes from one material into another. And refraction is the bending of light. You know that when it passes from one medium into another medium. It's just like if you take a pencil and put half of the pencil under water and half of the pencil in air. How will it appear to you? It will appear as if it's broken at the interface, correct? That's because of refraction. And that's why I say if you try to judge the depth of a swimming pool, and let's say you do not know how to swim, and you try to judge the depth of a swimming pool from outside, you're always going to be wrong. And you're not going to be wrong by a few centimeters. You're going to be wrong by a lot. For example, if the actual depth is four meters, that's a big depth, isn't it? Four meters. It's going to appear to be three meters to you. Because the, the bottom of the swimming pool appears to be raised up because of refraction. Can you follow what I'm trying to say? So all these facts keep happening, you know, and that's because of the bending of light. And why are we able to use lenses, you and me, se several ones, you know, who wear glasses and others are hiding it. You know, you have contact lenses. You're able to see because of refraction. That's how lenses are made, refraction. That's how the entire field of botany and zoology depends on, isn't it? Otherwise, they would never see microorganisms unless we had microscopes. Because if you didn't know, microscopes are made of lenses. Telescopes are made of lenses. So this is a crucial chapter. It's crucially important. But let's go back to the fundamentals. Here again, why does light bend? when it passes from one material into another? Because its speed changes. You know that if you're going so fast and if you apply sudden brakes, your car is going to turn. Well, now we have, nowadays we have anti-skid brakes, so it won't. But the old ones, you go at 75 and apply hard brakes, you're not going straight anymore. You're going, oh. Sudden change in speed causes bending. Did you get that? OK. So as light passes from air into glass, here the speed is 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. You remember that number? But as soon as it hits the surface, right from there, the speed becomes 2 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. And some of you are like, well, that's a small difference, is it? It went from 300,000 kilometers per second to 200,000 kilometers per second in that instant, and that causes the bending. But remember that it bends towards the perpendicular. Isn't that the perpendicular drawn? It bends towards the perpendicular because it's going from a less denser to a more dense material. That was an important point. 
If it's going from less dense to more dense, it bends towards the perpendicular, which means if it's going in the opposite direction, it bends away, right, from the perpendicular. You need to remember that. Okay. Now, that's the angle of incidence, and this is the angle of refraction. Will they be equal to each other? No way. So when you come to the law of refraction, it's not theta i is equal to theta r. The law of refraction is called the Snell's law, not the snail's law. Snell. Snell's law. OK, before we get to that Snell's law, I just I didn't know that I had done this. How do you read this? It's called refractive index. Refractive index, refractive index of glass with respect to air. That's how you read it. One more time, last time. <coughs> refractive index of glass with respect to air. Depends on where it's going, into what, OK? It's defined as the speed of light in the air divided by the speed of light in I gave you the numbers, so somebody tell me what's the refractive index of glass with respect to air? <coughs> I gave you the numbers. 1.5. And what's the unit? No unit. It's just a ratio. So the refractive index of glass is 1.5. The refractive index of fresh water is 1.33. The refractive index of diamonds, and you know diamonds are forever. <laughs> <laughs> is the highest. Diamonds have the highest refractive index. It's 2.1. That's why they are so precious. We're coming to that in a second. Do, does anybody know what diamonds are actually made of? And carbon is the cheapest material on the face of the earth. It's what you get when you burn something. But because of the arrangement of the carbon atoms and because of its special kind of refraction that you're going to look at, it becomes so precious that you give that to a lady, you know what happens after that. That's why we say diamonds are forever, OK? So try that out. All right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Do you know that when you get those diamonds from underground, it's not at all precious? Did you know that somebody has to give it a particular shape? And we're going to look at why somebody has to give it a particular shape and what happens when that particular shape is given. We're coming to that. OK. Like I said, the refractive index of glass with respect to air is 1.5. Proved. No unit. It's very clear. All right. Hopefully, I have the law here. Let's see when I have the law. This looks like a repetition. It's the same diagram, isn't it? Right? Same thing. Oh, yeah. The law is called Snell's law. And now you've got to be real careful because students make a mistake with Snell's law because they just cram it without understanding. You compare the refractive index of everything with respect to air. By now you know that, right? So can somebody tell me what's the refractive index of air? One. Thanks. One. But let's treat it as N1, yeah, N1. And the refractive index of the next medium is N2. And according to Snell's law, you always go N1 sine theta in that material, N1. The angle in that medium is theta i, isn't it? That's why you go N1 sine theta i is equal to N2 sine theta r. Did everybody understand what I said? So do not cram that equation. If you cram that equation, you are in trouble. I'm trying to show something here. Watch. If theta i is 50 degrees, go ahead and calculate theta r for me. If theta i is 50 degrees, go ahead and calculate, please. Go, 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 go. You just need a few seconds. That'll keep you awake. It's glass, yeah. And what's the refractive index of glass? We just now. I told you, it's one point. Yeah, so if it's 1.5, just find theta r. How much? About 30 degrees is what you get. All right, let's see whether I did something wrong or whether I did it right. So if you take more time than that, then your calculator is obviously not working. 
All right, 30.71 degrees, right? Now I want you to do this problem again. But this time the statement is, light goes from glass into air. You heard me. Light goes from glass into air. And the angle of incidence is 30 degrees. Can you work it out? Find theta r. Again, light goes from glass into air. And the angle of incidence is 30 degrees. Do you even have to work it out? The angle of refraction is going to be 50 degrees. Because didn't I tell you that everything in light is reversible? Oh. Come on now. But when you try to apply it into the formula, for those who are listening, and I'm not writing, it would be, I'm giving you the numbers. What is N1 for you if it's going from glass into air? That's N1, isn't it? So that'll be 1.5 sine 50, hello, should be equal to 1 times sine theta r. Is that clear? So you have to decide which is theta i, which is theta r, and the refractivity. So if you just cram it, you're going to make a mistake. And I'm not responsible. Now let's find out why diamonds are precious. It's because of a phenomenon called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. Okay. Watch this. Is this going from... I don't know what the, Okay, it looks like water. So is it going from water into air or air to water? How is it moving? Water into air. All right, so that's the angle of incidence not shown here. Oh, no, well, let's start from here. I'm starting wrong. Here, let's start here. So isn't the angle of incidence really small here? Come on. And so it comes out. You keep increasing the angle of incidence. Like you can see, this angle of incidence is bigger than what it was here. It keeps coming out. Remember, it's going away from the perpendicular. Can you make out that? It's going further and further away. Wow. At one particular angle of incidence, somebody tell me, what's the angle of refraction for that ray? What's the angle of refraction for this ray? Say it loud, please, like kindergarten students. <laughs> 90 degrees. You couldn't make up that? Have your brains checked? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, anyway, sorry. I meant it, though. <laughs> so, can you apply Snell's law now to that particular case? Go ahead. Apply Snell's law to this particular case. Call this N1. This is N2. Oh, it's already labeled N1, N2. So be with me. How would you write it? N1 sine theta C is equal to N2 sine 90. And sine 90 is? Therefore, rearrange that, please. And get it in the form N2 by N1. What do you get? Let's see whether you get it in the form N2 by N1. If you're writing, you get it. I'm not going to write everything. What do you have? What do you have for N2 by N1? Do you have sine theta C or 1 by sine theta C? Be careful. N2 by N1. Sine theta C. All right, box that. That's a very important formula. What do you mean by N2 by N1? That is the refractive index of 2 with respect to 1. You see that? I'll give you another formula now. So when you do N2 by N1, you're saying that's the refractive index of material 2 with respect to material 1. So you got a formula now. What is it? Sine theta C. And theta C, why is it called theta C? Because that's called the critical angle. What do you mean by the word critical? My friend is critically sick. What does that mean? Oh, he has every chance of passing over from life into death. The word critical always shows we are at the moment of a change. Are you listening? That is why it's called critical angle. And you have critical temperature, critical angle, critical pressure. You have so many critical. Whenever it comes critical something, you know, oh, there's going to be a change. That's a boundary condition. You know exactly why it's a boundary condition. What happens if you increase the angle of incidence further? It doesn't go out, can't you see? It returns. So it's totally reflected now. 
This is called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection. So what are the conditions for total internal reflection? Two conditions. Number one, the ray must be going from a more dense to a less dense. Correct? Because we need it to be going further and further away from the perpendicular. So number, condition number one, it should be going away from the perpendicular. Up, going from a more dense to less dense. Condition number two, help me out. Condition number two, the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle. All right, go ahead, find the critical angle for diamond because I gave you its refractive index. What did I say it was? All right, so usually it goes from diamonds into air, correct? So it's 2.1. Didn't I say 2.1? If I'm wrong, I'll correct it. Once you get the number, I'll know if I'm right. 2.1, what's the refractive index of air? Of air. Okay, so it's just 2.1 is equal to sine theta c. Find out theta c for me. 24 some degree. What do you get? Is, isn't it one over <coughs> yeah. I don't know. It depends. That's why I was asking you. How did you get it? That's why I was asking you. Is it how much? All right. So use the refractive index as 2.4, please. 2.4, because that critical angle doesn't sound. How much? So actually, the the refractive index of a, of diamond is not 2.1. It's 2.4. And I apologize. It's not 2.1. It's 2.4. So when you use 2.4, what do you get? 24.6 degrees. Now can somebody tell me why diamonds are precious? We're getting closer. Hold on. I'll show you. I'm going to explain it. All right. Theta C is called the critical angle. Blah, blah, blah. Conditions. I told you two conditions for TIR. That's total internal reflection. Okay. And that's a diamond. And diamonds are for it, like a tool. Okay. Theta C is small. Did you notice that theta C is 24 degrees? Because the refractive index is large. And that's a real diamond. Don't grab it. But that's how it looks. And as you can see, it's been cut to perfection. It's given a particular shape. All right. If a light ray enters a diamond, watch this. Right now, it's going from air, air into diamond, isn't it? All right, so it just bends towards the perpendicular, but this is the point where you have to listen. Now, isn't it trying to go from the diamond into air at this point? And the diamond has been shaped in such a way that this angle of incidence is greater than 24 degrees. Are you with me? Therefore, it has no chance of escape. It's totally internally reflected. Same thing happens here. And then finally it comes out. You know, this total internal reflection might happen hundreds of times before the ray is finally able to come out. And that's going to happen to every ray that gets in. So it looks like all the light is trapped inside. So when you look at it from outside, it sparkles because there's so much light caught up inside, going back and forth inside before it comes out. Did you get it? So that's why diamonds are so precious. They sparkle. But compare this with gold. Gold shines. Diamonds sparkle. What's the difference? Shining is a superficial phenomenon. If you know what I mean. Shining is just reflection off the surface, isn't it? But what about sparkling? It is total internal reflection. Now, you, you don't understand because... But you would. Have you seen those reflectors that we put behind automobiles? Reflectors? Do you know that all those reflectors are total internal reflecting prisms made of plastic? What happens is the light from the head beam of something goes, falls into that, goes in, and returns back. So it appears as if the light is coming from inside. Does that make any sense? That's what a reflector is. A good reflector is total internal reflecting. The other one is just going to produce a glare. If it's superficial, it produces a glare. We don't even want to look at it. If it's total internal reflection, it's not glaring. It's like, oh, there's light source inside. That is the difference. All right, the last part of this long day, 
is refraction through a prism. If you've seen a prism, how many faces does a prism have? It's three-dimensional, so it's like this. It could have different shapes. Two sides, two, and a base. It'll be five. I'm talking about a triangular prism. Are you with me? Okay, two sides here. And what you're going to see on the screen is just the profile of a prism. So you're going to only see two sides. I can't show you these two. And you will see the base. And it's amazing what happens when light passes through the prism. Let's check it out. Let's see. That's an incident ray. Be with me. Is it going from less dense to more dense? Okay, how will it bend? towards the perpendicular. But first you have to draw the perpendicular there, right? How will the perpendicular look like? Wouldn't it have to be drawn this way? Come on. It has to be perpendicular to that surface, isn't it? Okay, that's going to come up and then that bends towards. And here at the second phase, it's going from more dense to less dense. So it bends away from that perpendicular which you would have to draw here. I'm sure I've drawn both, and we will see. Now you see the perpendiculars drawn, both of them. And if I were to label the angles, you know, this is the first angle of incidence. Wouldn't this be the, would this be the next angle of refraction? Would this be the angle? No, it should be between the refracted ray and the perpendicular, with this one. This will be the second angle of incidence. This will be the final angle at which it comes out. So there are four angles here, which I have labeled theta, one, I'll wait for it to come up. It's slow now, theta two, theta three, and theta four. I'm trying to show those are the angles. That is a constant for any prism. It's called the angle of the prism. Because you know you cannot change, it's made of glass or plastic or whatever, right? You can't change that, can you? It's fixed. So there are some constants. A is the angle of the prism, that's constant. And now what I did is, I just extended the incident ray and the ray that's coming out. Isn't it? And therefore, isn't this the total angle through which it turns? How many times did the ray bend? Twice. Twice. But if you could imagine that both those bendings took place in one step, that would be the bending. That's called the deviation. Well, the word has meaning how much it has bent. Okay. Make out that. That's called the angle of deviation, little d. And from the geometry of this diagram, you're going to have so many formulas come up. And I'm not going to derive each one of them, but let me speed this up a little bit. One of the most important ones is this one. Theta 2 plus theta 3 is always equal to the angle of the prism. Why is it important? Didn't I say that the angle is a constant? Okay, now tell me this. That's a silly question. Is theta 2 and theta 3 fixed, or can they change? They can change according to theta 1. But no matter how they change, when you add these two, you should always get... There you go. That's a very important formula that you're going to use, I'm telling you. And deviation is theta 1 minus theta 2 plus theta 4 minus theta 3, which I can rearrange, and I can show that it's related to the angle of the prism by this very important one that's coming up. That one is important, too. Deviation is theta 1 plus theta 4 minus A. Okay. Uh, that's just rearranging that. Okay. This is the same thing. You can either treat this as important or this one is the same thing. I just had A go to the other side. But it'll be easier for you to remember. This adds up to A. The other two add up to A plus D. Isn't that easier for you to remember? Theta 1 plus theta 4 is A plus D. Very important. Now, last thing. Can we apply Snell's law here, please? Snell's law. Hello? Okay, how would it appear to be? That's N1. That's N2. 
Please write it down. It's appearing here, but you, I'll let you write it first. If you apply Snell's law here, how would it be? This is a test for you. If you can write it correctly, you got it. Tell me. At this point, how would Snell's law be? N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. Correct? Good. But now let's apply it here. How would it be here? Be careful at this point. It would be N2 sine theta 3 is equal to N1 because the outside is air again. N1 sine theta 4. If you got that, you, you understood. But if you have to cram that, you're going to be in trouble. I promise you. If you have to cram Snell's law, you're going to be in trouble because each question will be different. Those are the four important formulas for a prism. With that, we finished the lecture. I hope it did you good. Thank you.